Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're all having a lovely day today so far. I'm really excited to announce onto the stage for the Building Lightning Apps segment of today's program. Um, first up, I think we've got Connor Okus from Spiral. Welcome to the stage. Do we clap them as they come on stage? Yeah? Come on down. Uh, followed by Alex Bosworth of Lightning Labs. Come on down. Woo! And Hannah Rosenberg. Welcome to the stage, Hannah. Fantastic. So, yeah, if we sit like this, this is perfect. Um, so yeah, my name's Joe Hall. I work for Cointelegraph, but don't worry, this is a completely Bitcoin-only panel. It's no shit coins, none of that stuff. Um, I'm the Bitcoin-only guy at Cointelegraph, so there's literally no risk of that. Um, I hope you're feeling charged. I hope you've got your wattage up today. I hope you're ready to be shocked. I was Googling ChatGPT how to do lightning pums uh, as, as an introduction to a panel earlier. Um, okay, so we're going to learn how to build lightning apps, why building lightning apps is so important. Um, but before we get to that, I was actually asking Alex, um, a little bit stumped this morning, what is a lightning app? Um, so when, when we get to that question, <clears throat> before we get to that question, let's do an intro and just, you know, how are you doing today? who you represent, and then we'll jump into the questions. So Hannah, then Alex, then, then Connor. OK, awesome. Good morning. I am sleep deprived, but doing well. <laughs> so um, i Hannah Rosenberg. I've been in um, Bitcoin for coming up on 11 years now, which is just insane. Wow. But I'm currently working as a developer advocate um, at Lightning Labs. But I have um, also, uh, my husband is now running a business that does Bitcoin Lightning integration. So that's like. It's many things that I've done, but those are the two really relevant things for today's discussion. Fantastic. Alex? Uh, I'm Alex Bosworth. I'm the head of Lightning Liquidity at Lightning Labs. Uh, I've worked at Lightning Labs for over four years now, um, so working on Lightning a long time. And um, I work on kind of products and services that Lightning Labs offers, like Lightning Loop. Fantastic. Morning, everyone. My name's Connor. I'm a product manager at Spiral. Um, for those who don't know, Spiral's an initiative within Block that funds open source developers, designers, and some PMs. So we fund uh, quite a few Lightning infrastructure projects, as well as kind of tools that make building on Lightning a lot easier. Fantastic. So as you can see today, we're in really good hands. We've got Hannah, of course, on the more sort of teaching, marketing, understanding Lightning side, Alex on the techie Lightning side, and Connor on the who's who, who should we invest in in the Lightning side. And then me, who tries to make sense of it all and try to write about it. Um, so Alex, I was asking you earlier, and we were both a bit um, confused as to what is a Lightning app. Is a Phoenix Lightning Wallet a Lightning app? Is a Wallet of Satoshi, is that a Lightning app? Or is there a specific definition? Does it have to just transact on the Lightning Network and that's it? I think that's a broad definition, but like it's not super useful. Like mm -hmm. I think Lightning app, a lot of people use it like to compare with other chain app ideas. So like they're saying, oh, well, what if we, you know, just have apps that do work in decentralized ways um, or, you know, are accessible to anybody in the world, mm -hmm. but instead of using some specific coin that was made up just for that, what if we just use Bitcoin and Lightning for that so that we can kind of scale it out and we don't have to like tie those two things together super tightly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I mean, can we get a sense of the room today? Like who has interacted with the Lightning Network? Just raise your hand if you have. Oh, nice. What do you think? More than half the room? It's a pretty good amount. Yeah. yeah. Good okay. Amount. Who's built a Lightning app? Awesome. Decent. I'm grateful for your service. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I, I do think Lightning app is quite a broad term, but I think generally we're speaking about kind of the spectrum of the kind of self-sovereign, non-custodial wallet that you might experience with someone like Phoenix or Breeze all the way up to like um, managed services such as Lightning service providers and LSPs and routing nodes. So I think that there's like a spectrum of... Mm -hmm. Of, of things that we define as like apps. So. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting too is we're seeing more and more apps that use Lightning, right? So things that do like, you know, podcasting, gaming, and all this stuff, and now they're Lightning enabled. So what is a Lightning app and what's an app that uses Lightning? And, uh, so is there anything that kind of, you know, connects you to the network? Mm -hmm. I'd say you can kind of call it a Lightning app. So. Okay. And why is it that we need Lightning apps? I mean, I thought that Lightning Network, when it was first proposed, and 2016, was it, by Taj and Poon? They, they said that, you know, this is the payments protocol. It's going to be for micropayments, this sort of thing. Why are we now building Lightning apps on it, given that I can now, you know, buy a coffee over the Lightning Network? Have we not completed it? Is that not what the Lightning Network was for? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it's, you know, it's magic internet money, and you can do so much more cool stuff with Lightning, right? So why wouldn't we have all the really amazing things? Why wouldn't we have, you know, the streaming payments to APIs and all kinds of really awesome stuff that we can do because we have dramatically better money to use on the back end of these systems, right? So, mm -hmm. no, there's so much cool stuff to do. Let's do all the cool things. Yeah. Yeah, is there anything that's particularly exciting you in the Lightning segment right now? Like why we're getting, why we're using these things, why we're building them out? Uh, I'm, there's so much to talk about, right? And there's like, we're looking at like the first world, like stuff that we have here now, or you're looking at other parts of the world. But if we look here, I think, um, you know, just Lightning's gonna wind up on the back end of so many different applications, right? So I talk about like apps that use Lightning, right? Because I imagine a future where we have all kinds of applications and someone's using it and don't even realize that Lightning is powering what they're using, right? Mm -hmm. And then other parts of the world, I mean, we have, I will, I will shill our latest thing, you know, the, well, our latest release, Taproot Assets, right? And that's, you know, something that will be available on the Lightning Network, which is just amazing to do fungible assets on Lightning and what that might enable. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I'm really, really looking forward to seeing how that goes and what applications we come up with there. No, congratulations. I was speaking about it earlier. That is phenomenal stuff. Um, yeah. What does that mean concretely, though? I mean, what's the TLDR of taproot assets onto the Lightning Network? Well, think stable coins on Lightning, mm -hmm. you know? So you have this amazing payment network, um, and then you have this really interesting use case, which is in high demand. Um, and that's, you know, so you think about the first world, like what we all might be using, and then other places in the world where stable coins and those type of use cases are really, really impactful. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's another amazing sort of offshoot to be able to build on the Lightning Network, right? It was, yeah. I'm guessing that Alex was part of the brains behind it? Were you the guy that was decided to bring this onto the protocol? Behind a lot of things, but yeah. <laughs> well, one thing that I think is, is really interesting about it is that in the middle of sending uh, fiat across the network, it, it would still use Bitcoin in the, in the middle. So we kind of, uh, it kind of allows us to build on all the progress that we've made already in building out Bitcoin for Lightning. Because actually Lightning, I think the first release of LND actually used Litecoin because they were the first to activate SegWit. Mm -hmm. So as far as testing went, you know, Bitcoin Lightning is, is kind of its own project. And it was, we actually even saw the two paths, what can happen if we can build a community on Lightning on Bitcoin versus Litecoin, because the Litecoin network went nowhere and the Bitcoin network became huge. Mm -hmm. um, so that network effect has taken us years to create. And that's something that we can leverage with new protocols at the edge. So that's also kind of like the idea of Lightning applications, is that you can build something that lives in your own world. It doesn't interact with anybody, but you can access other applications and other people across a common protocol. And it also is building upon the network effect. So if I have dollars and I want to pay somebody who is accepting funds on the Lightning network, uh, there can be kind of somebody at the edge who will make that translation for me. And then the, the payment will be carried across with Bitcoin and we don't need to build a new network effect. We can just build. We can just build onto the existing network effect. Yeah, no, and that's huge, isn't it? And that's obviously a lot of what a lot of other trigger warning cryptocurrencies um, have <laughs> as well. You know, they don't have this this network effect. Um, how would you sort of evaluate the current state of the Lightning Network right now? And the reason why I ask that is because a large part of my job is demonstrating to people that the Lightning Network not only works, but it works really, really well and oftentimes better than existing systems, existing payment rails, that sort of thing. But I have a really difficult time trying to demonstrate that to people. Because, um, I mean, as we saw when the, the room raised their hand earlier, you know, half, two thirds of the room has used the Lightning Network, but a third of people here who are clearly interested in Bitcoin haven't used the Lightning Network yet. And we're at the free open source stage, you know. The main stage, it might be a completely different um, survey. Yeah. So, you know, how can we, um, no, we'll get to that later. What's the current state of the um, Lightning Network right now? What do you reckon, Connor? Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess I can talk more to like the current state of builders and developers, and mm -hmm. like the, the trend we're seeing is definitely kind of up and to the right. Um, speaking from a more kind of trying to get developers to build non-custodial, sovereign experiences on mobile environments. Mm -hmm. Um, we're definitely seeing a trend that's up and to the right across mobile, desktop, web, and also kind of LSPs. Um, 
LDK specifically is like a full uh, lightning implementation that's spec compliant and interoperable with like the LNDs and core lightnings and Eclair of this world, but exposes um, all of the functionality via uh, an API or a, a suite of APIs that are customizable. So it's a, a lot easier for kind of developers to kind of drop in the parts of Lightning um, that they want, especially in mobile environments. Um, so we're definitely seeing a trend that's positive in, in that direction. Um, we have kind of like a roadmap that is going to bring a lot of new function functionality um, to, to different types of applications as well. So stuff like Bolt 12 um, will enable, you know, the use cases around being able to, to pay static invoices, um, reusable payment um, experiences as well. So I think the trend is definitely like in the right direction. So we kind of just want to keep seeing more of that really. So. Yeah. And does that mean that for these plug and play solutions that you mentioned, mm -hmm. why are people not thinking mobile first anyway? Is this surely Lightning Network is a, a mobile first or mobile native sort of technology? Well, it's, it's just, I guess, just a, around the constraints of, of um, building on mobile, um, the kind of memory and storage requirements that are, are, are required for Lightning, the kind of liveness requirements as well, um, stuff like being able to receive offline. Um, so we, that's, that's also something that we're working on. Um, the term kind of ASIC payments has been kind of thrown around and that's the term we're using to kind of um, enable uh, mobile applications to receive payments while offline. Mm -hmm. um, but typically like our team, the kind of inception of LDK was that our team did research and kind of asked wallet developers what it is that are the kind of stumbling blocks and challenges we're building and applications or wallets and typically it would take like a couple of developers, a couple of years to build like a very basic wallet. Um, and the learning curve to, to, to build it on Lightning is very steep, even with something like LDK, which gives you kind of like this API to use. And so uh, one of the things our team is actually building is something called LDK Node, which is a kind of ready to go LDK implementation that has a lot of the stuff that you want kind of baked in already. So it comes with like an on-chain wallet. It comes with um, the ability to source blockchain data via Explorer or Electrum. It gives you, um, it uses the RGS protocol or Rapid Gossip Sync, which allows you to quickly get the network graph um, and privately calculate um, a path for your payments on the mobile itself um, and basically exposes that in this what we call like a, a mobile first recipe where you can um, kind of plug and play this kind of 15 method API as exposed to like the full LDK API which has over I don't know at this point probably 800 or 900 methods it's really condensed down and is designed to be like a mobile first recipe um, and we're going to expose that in different languages as well. So it's written in Rust, mm -hmm. but say you're an Android developer or an iOS developer, all of that functionality will, will be exposed in the relevant languages such as Swift or Kotlin or Java, okay. Python as well, um, using UniFFI. So just, you know, trying to find a happy medium of abstracting away a lot of the lower level lightning logic and just making it a bit more accessible for developers so they don't have to kind of climb that steep learning curve. Yeah, I mean, I definitely understood about half of what you just said there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why these two are on stage as well. Um, I mean, I think that, that part of that, I mean, obviously there's the coding level of the Bitcoin ecosystem and those unfortunate people like myself who just really struggle with coding and really struggle with the techie side. But then we're also really keen to use these solutions, really keen to sort of propagate these solutions. Um, how to sort of bridge that gap between the fact that there is incredibly high level, sophisticated tech going on, and then the users that just want to use it and want to take advantage of those solutions and want to, for example, live on a Bitcoin standard and want to be able to send payments around the world, want to be able to stream sats to their podcasts and live in a sort of lightning enabled world. How do you bridge that gap? What do you think, Anna? 
uh, with lightning application developers. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think we're, we're really getting to the point talking about like what's the state of the network, you know, when it was just like this weird hobbyist thing to do. And then I think in 2021, like it really became like really solidly usable. And then now we're at the point where like we're really maturing to like this professional thing that you can actually like really, you know, if you're running a business and the things, you know, doesn't work 10% of the time, like that's a big problem. And we're really at the point where it's, we're really seeing a lot of applications, a very robust network um, that it's really like professional grade stuff that you can use. Um, and so I think we get this, you know, it, this winds up being used by lots of people and being the back end of all kinds of different things when we have, you know, developers that go out and build these really awesome applications. And we're really starting to see that now. And I think, you know, there's having really um, good, usable, reliable tech um, and good resources um, and good community is how you get those developers in to build awesome things that everyone's going to go use. Awesome. And yeah, and yeah just UX as well. Um, just want to show like the Bitcoin design community. I don't know how many people are aware of that, but like we have a community of designers who are focused on the non-custodial sovereign experience for users as well. And they're kind of like congregating in small groups on small initiatives. So like developers and designers are working on what the Bolt 12 experience will look like for the end user or what a unified QR code experience looks like where you know, the user doesn't really have to know the difference between Bitcoin and Lightning. Um, so I think design and that community has a big role to play in what the end user experience is like as well. Mm. Yeah, no, plus one for that. I think that a lot of Bitcoin UX as a whole could be improved in, within Lightning Network specifically. It could definitely, um, yeah, do with some changes, right? Um, Alex, um, with regards to Bolt 12, um, when's it coming and what does that mean for the ability to build Lightning apps? Um, well, I don't know, like there's no timeline for, for community like driven things, right? Mm -hmm. So different people are going to discuss different things and have their own takes on it. Um, I think there's You're also rough, different rough dates this year. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, okay. So the, but the, there's also like different components to think about yeah. because there's a lot of different things that have even been removed and, um, you know, maybe more things will be added. I think um, there's like different aspects to improve upon on lightning payments. So one aspect that we could improve upon is um, the scalability of the network. Mm -hmm. So like um, one thing we do right now is we advertise our nodes generally to everybody in the network. So every person is advertising their node and all their channels to everybody else in the network. What does that mean, advertise a node? So, you know, like when you are using regular on-chain Bitcoin, when you send a transaction, you broadcast this transaction to everybody. You say, hey, I'm sending this transaction out. And then everybody receives that and they synchronize it, either via the mempool or via, you know, eventually via blocks. So um, that's, uh, not, that's kind of like why we created the Lightning Network, is we said that that's not a scalable model. Like the more people who join, let's say we have a billion people. So, OK, now a billion people are going to send the transaction, and then a billion, billion people are all going to have to sync this and verify it and add it to their blockchain. That's not a scalable solution. Yeah. So the idea is, what if we really only have the parties to the transaction involved, or a minimal set of parties, like just the hops in between, involved, that's a much more scalable solution. That's kind of like the core design concept of the Lightning Network. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we kind of took a shortcut, I think, with the, with the design of the Lightning Network in terms of how nodes are advertised, how, because it has a similar model in terms of like, I'm going to advertise my node out there to everybody and on all my channels. And it even has like a heartbeat protocol. So I'm actually going to not just advertise it once, I'm going to continually advertise it. And same thing for channels. And also, every time I change my fees, I'm going to change, change them up and down. I'm going to advertise, advertise. So it creates a lot of traffic on the network. And what, so, you know, relating it back to like um, new features that we're going to add, one thing that could be interesting is like uh, instead of everybody advertising, uh, we, in, in the beginning of the Lightning Network, uh, the way that it was planned to in the future scale this is to say, I'm only going to advertise if I'm a solid routing node. And at the final legs, final hops of the route, I'm going to define how to reach me from a well-known routing node. 
And that way, we won't have to have everybody announce them themselves. We won't have to have all the channels announce themselves. We just have to have well-known landmarks kind of thing. So like if I'm in a, if I'm in a big city and I want to know how to get to you, uh, I can kind of point out, hey, I'm next to this really tall building. You can take a look at that building, and I'm just you know, a few streets away. So I don't have to tell you about the entire city, and I don't have to expect that you're going to keep that in sync, like, which is difficult for mobile nodes. Like The more you know, billions of people who are going to be adding this, you, you can't really expect to keep everybody's address synced constantly and all of those fee changes and all of those uh, node details constantly in sync with the uh, mobile devices. Right. So um, that's something that I think will, will probably be, uh, we'll probably start on that pr pretty soon with, with the, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a feature that I'm most excited about. But it also, the thing about LND is that, uh, you know, so we have a community of uh, spec implementers who, that's a decentralized community, but also LND, the people who contribute to LND are decentralized. They're people from different companies. And w that's also why it's hard to make timelines because these are people, you know, it's not like a top down kind of, you know, you get your marching orders about here's what feature to implement. It's more like we're working with other people on different companies on a, a common goal and we're going to try to merge these changes in, but we don't know exactly, you know, will somebody have time? Is this their priority in this, in this time period? And that's something I think is like a strength of L&D is we, we're trying to build more developers from more different co companies or independent contributors and get them to build these features in rather than just saying like, we're Lightning Labs, we own this project and you know, no outside contributions like allowed, we run how, how it works. Awesome. No, no, it's, it's, it's super encouraging the way in which that plays out. And I mean, I couldn't help but thinking when you're mentioning that, you know, if we're going to scale the Bitcoin base chain to billions of people or billions of JPEGs, then we're going to, you know. <laughs> well, it, it's also a lot more privacy preserving to, yes, yeah. to like, to, to achieve scalability in a way where you're not advertising everything. Because mm -hmm. like when everybody's advertising their node and all their channels, they're kind of giving a lot of information away about like where I am and what are my coins. So, it, and that's also the benefit of the Lightning Network is as we achieve scalability, we're removing a lot of data that used to be broadcast to everybody, yeah. like an individual transaction, and we're narrowing it to achieve scale, but it also achieves, it's also incentive compatible and it achieves like privacy in a way that's sustainable and scalable to the world. Yeah, no, it's really, really exciting, really encouraging. Um, but to that point about you know, the scalability, like in, over the past few weeks, I'm sure a lot of people in the room are aware that the Bitcoin base chain fees have been rocketing. You know, at some point, they're you know, $40, $50. And a lot of people that are proponents of uh, you know, minting ordinals and um, doing wacky stuff on the base chain would say that, ah, oh, this has caused this influx of activity and development in the Lightning Network, which is what the Lightning Network's for. It's a layer two. You know, Bitcoin was always going to scale in layers. Um, do you guys agree with that? Have you guys noticed this uptick in activity or in even liquidity coming into the Lightning Network? I, I mean, I think it's hard to ignore like the chain fee increases, and it's caused a lot of you know um, problems that are easy to ignore when the chain fees are low. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, like that's one strength of LND is that we've been deploying it for four years in production. Huge nodes run it, small nodes run it. Um, so there's, you know, so much feedback and that, that's, but something that we don't get is like, what happens if this weird scenario, like, oh, chain fees are super high happens. And then once, once that does happen, there, it like reveals all sorts of new problems that we didn't really think about or stuff we did think about, but we kind of like said, oh, well, that's not super high priority now because chain fees aren't like that. And are they going to just jump from zero to 200 in like a day? But so, um, I think that the, the, the problem though is like, Lightning doesn't just scale transactions on Bitcoin generically. It doesn't scale tra transaction data generically. Like, if you want to have, um, and, and so, you know, we're, we release a, um, the Taproot Assets Protocol um, version 0 0.2, and uh, it's trying to scale some of these type of uses in terms of non-Bitcoin assets, but uh, it's, the scalability is using the Lightning's network Lightning Network ability to scale changes in balances between people. That's easier to, to scale. If you have to scale kind of like individual uh, like item ownership and then kind of offload that to a network of other people to say, okay, maintain this re registry of, of item ownership to me, that's not very scalable. So I think we're focusing on like the parts of it that can, that can be scalable. And the other parts, I think, require more 
more development, but it's not something that we're necessarily focused on. Uh, so maybe somebody else will, will, could, could come up with ideas for it. Oh, OK. I hope everyone's listening. Um, Hannah, you were nodding your head there when I was commenting yeah, on the well, influx negativity. Alex gave a much more in-depth answer than I had. <laughs> my, <laughs> my answer was just like, yeah, this is definitely uh, I've gotten an increase in queries about the Lightning Network. And you know, so I think you see a lot of businesses, builders that were kind of flirting with Lightning, like, oh, I don't know, maybe. And then the past couple of weeks, they're like, yep, it's done. <laughs> yeah, definitely. that's wonderful, though, right? Yeah. A lot of like also companies that, you know, were kind of delaying things, you know, a fees, you, you might see, oh, I'm paying, a, you know, five dollars in fees. But to them, they're sending thousands of transactions, these companies. And so it's like, OK, now it costs us one hundred thousand dollars a year to go on chain, maybe we should hire somebody to implement Lightning Network. Mm. I mean, Binance and Coinbase are supposedly yeah. taking note of this, this increase in cost, right? Yeah, so. and I think that's real. That's a real yeah. effect. Awesome, yeah. Also nodding your head, Connor. No, I was just going to say, um, yeah, I mean, there's still quite a lot of challenges with regards to like security, privacy, and Lightning only scales, I guess, an order of magnitude of uh, order of magnitude above what we have on chain. Um, but I think it's still many of the, the challenges that we have, the solutions are being actively worked on and it is kind of like a multi-year kind of process. And hopefully within the next kind of three to five year time frame, we have experiences that are kind of on par with the current payment system. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if if people pollute in the chain of JPEGs, it's going to be accelerated, and so be it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, people are people are ready and, and willing to build on Lightning, so that's just you know remains encouraging. Yeah, so. no, for sure. Are we calling a new phrase there? JPEG pollution. <laughs> uh, I don't want to start any wars. Man. Yeah, sorry, no, that was, <laughs> I'm just joking. Out. Um, okay, um, we're coming up to sort of the last couple of minutes here. I'd love it if you could share with the audience like a couple of takeaways of you know how they can get involved building on Lightning apps. You know, ways in which they can better interact with the Lightning network. As as we've established, you know, not everyone is Lightning native or Lightning first. And I mean, anecdotally, when I've paid a lot of sort of uh, Bitcoin uh, OGs or people that have been in Bitcoin for a long time. Most of them will give me a, an address beginning with BC1 XYZ rather than a Lightning address or a Lightning invoice for like amounts of like $20, $30, that sort of thing. And I'm like, why are they not using Lightning? So I think that, yeah, this has, the recent fee spike has caused some people to, you know, awaken to the mm -hmm. fact that there is this Lightning thing. But what would you sort of share with the audience as a takeaway? You know, how can they go, go home at the end of this weekend and start tinkering with the Lightning network? What sort of takeaways would you give them? Yeah, I'd say, you know, it's, there's been amazing momentum lately, right? And just to watch this network build and build to the point where, like, I, I have no chance of keeping up with everything that's happening in Lightning, despite trying constantly. Um, so there's amazing momentum. It is an amazing time um, to get involved um, with Lightning and to build things. And we work really hard at trying to assist people to do that, right? So we try to make a very, you know, reliable, very usable um, software. And then we have uh, amazing um, documentation and Slack channels and all of that. And I think it's really a great community. So if you're thinking about, you know, tinkering with this stuff or building something, it's, I think the timing is so good, right? Just dive in and there's so many options and reach out and talk to us and I'll be hanging around if you've got questions and yeah. Go for it. Timing's good. And check out Hannah's or Lightning Labs YouTube channel because, I mean, I personally found that very useful in preparation for this panel today. So I'm sure you <laughs> will too, <laughs> Alex. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Lightning is kind of like still uh, something that is under like underappreciated. And, you know, even just from a perspective of having fun, I think Lightning is great because it gives you a lot of instant thrills to like make money or even you know spend money and something happens instantly. It's not like you have to wait ten minutes, and the, the, that carries through to the developer experience. You know, like making sure that your chain fee is high enough, and then waiting ten minutes or twenty minutes for the for you know it could be even an hour for your transaction to confirm. That's not the the most pleasant like development experience in terms of testing. <laughs> so I think. Uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're starting to see on your phone, like, oh, I, I earned some sats, 
that's a great experience, and that's something that you can drive yourself. You know, there's nobody stopping you, and nobody can shut you down. So uh, that's some, it's, it's kind of like a fun and rewarding experience just to build these apps and try to offer value to people that they'll reward you for. Absolutely. That, yeah, definite shout out to the, the fact that, you know, once you start transacting, interacting with Lightning more, and you get those random pings to your phone, like if you're on Nostr or any of these protocols that allow you to receive sats from someone, someone sends you 69 sats, it does make me smile. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. <laughs> um, Connor. Uh, we've got five seconds. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, check out the Latin Development Kit, uh, LatinDevKit.org. Uh, read the case studies. We just uh, released a new case study space. You can see like the diversity of project that's using LDK. Check out the roadmap as well. There's a long list of like new functionality that is being built throughout this year as well. And if you're interested in contributing to LDK, it's a free open source project as well, free for anyone to use and contribute to. So yeah, come and join us on, on Discord and GitHub and hang out with us there. Join us. Lightning is fun. Fantastic. This has been the Building Lightning Apps panel today with Hannah Rosenberg, Connor Okus, and Alex Bosworth. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely day. Thank you, man. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.